This video will discuss how to obtain the activity of solutes which have very, very low vapor pressures. So from the previous video, we defined the activity of a solute in terms of its molality to be the vapor pressure of that solute divided by its Henry's Law coefficient in terms of molality. So this presents a problem because many of the many of the solutes that we're interested in studying in this chapter, things like, say, sodium chloride or glucose or any solid uh, that can be easily dissolved in aqueous solution or in water or maybe any other kind of solution, they're going to have very, very low vapor pressures at room uh, temperature. So the pressure, the vapor pressure of our solute is going to be much, much, much lower than one bar. So we have no chance of measuring it by uh, experimental equipment. So we have to find an alternative approach in order to get the activity of our solute, which directly relates to the Gibbs energy of that solute, which we need for uh, further applications in this chapter. Okay, so the activity is going to approach the molality as the molality approaches zero. So our solvent, our solute, is going to approach ideal Henry's law behavior as it becomes very dilute. Uh, similarly, the activity of our solvent, which is uh, component one, is going to approach its mole fraction as that mole fraction approaches one. That's a Raoul's law standard state from our previous video. The activity of our solvent is defined as the vapor pressure of that solvent divided by the vapor pressure of a pure liquid of that solvent. Now this isn't a problem to measure because our solvent is a is going to be a liquid under the temperature and pressure that we measure it, so we'll have uh, the ability to measure what its vapor pressure is. Okay, so let's use an alternative approach. So to start off, we'll look at the mole fraction of our solute, chi2, which is equal to the number of moles of our solute divided by the number of moles of solvent plus the number of moles of solute. So if our solute is very dilute, the number of moles of solvent is much, much greater than the number of moles of solute. So if N1 is much, much greater than N2, then N1 plus N2 is approximately equal to N1. And our mole fraction of our solute is approximately the number of moles of solute divided by the number of moles of solvent. Okay, so what about molality? Molality is the number of moles of solute divided by the number of kilograms of solvent. So how many kilograms of solvent do we have? Well, if we look at the molar mass of the solvent, that's how many kilograms of solvent there are per mole of solvent. If we multiply that molar mass by the number of moles of solvent, we'll have the number of moles of the solute divided by the kilograms of solvent. So the molality equals N2 over N1 times big M1. All right, so our mole fraction of our solute is approximately equal to its molality times the molar mass of the solvent in kilograms per mole when we have a dilute solution. So the natural log of our activity of the solvent is approximately the natural log of the mole fraction of the solvent because it's mole fraction is approximately one, which is equal to the natural log of one minus the mole fraction of our solute. So chi one plus chi two equals one. So chi two, uh, chi one equals one minus chi two. And for the natural log of one minus chi two, if we take a Taylor series of the natural log of one minus x, you'll find that the linear term, the first non-zero term in that Taylor series is minus x. So the natural log of one minus chi two is approximately minus chi two. And we saw that chi two is approximately m2 m1. So minus chi two is approximately minus molality of the solute times molar mass of the solvent. So for dilute solutions, what we've shown is that the natural log of the activity of the solvent is approximately the negative molality of the solute times the molar mass in kilograms per mole of the solvent. 
All right, so now we're going to define a new quantity called the osmotic coefficient. This is equal to the negative natural log of the activity of the solvent divided by the molality of the solute times the molar mass of the solvent. So the natural log of the activity of our solvent is equal to minus molality of the solute times the osmotic coefficient times the molar mass of the solvent. So for an ideal solution, um, this is all going to work out and our osmotic coefficient should be one because nat natural log of activity should equal minus M2, M1. So the osmotic coefficient should be one for ideal solutions. All right, now we're going to use the gibbs duhem equation for the relative change in chemical potential of two substances. So the number of moles of solvent times the change in the chemical potential in the solvent plus the number of moles of solute times the change in chemical potential of the solute is equal to zero if we have a constant temperature and pressure in the external environment. So this is N1 <clears throat> times the, nat the change in the natural log of the activity of the solvent plus the number of moles of solute times the change in the natural log of the activity of the solute. So this comes from our expression for the chemical potential of each component in a solution uh, based off of its mole fraction. All right, so the number of moles of solute is equal to the molality of the solute times the molar mass of the solvent times number of moles of the solvent. So we have N1 times D, then we have minus M2 phi M1 from our substituting in for what the natural log of A1 is. Plus, then we have number of moles of two is M2 M1 N1 times D natural log of A2, and this is all equal to zero. All right, so we can uh, move some things to the other side here. We've got, a, we've got a negative sign there, so we can pull that out and then move everything to the other side. We get M1 N1 times D M2 phi. I pulled M1 out there because that is a constant, so that doesn't change. Equals M1 N1 times M2 D natural log of. And now instead of the activity of the solute, I put it in as the activity coefficient of the solute times the molality of the solute. So the activity coefficient, remember, is uh, whatever sorry, the activity coefficient is one if we have an ideal solution and it deviates there based off of any kind of non-ideal behavior. Okay, but uh, the, activi the activity coefficient in this case is defined as the activity over the molality, so activity equals activity coefficient times the molality. Okay, so we can cancel some terms. We have molar mass of the solvent on both sides, number of moles of the solvent on both sides, um, I can take this dm2 phi here, use the product rule on that, m2 d phi plus phi dm2, so molality of the solvent times change in osmotic coefficient plus osmotic coefficient times the change in molality. That is equal to, on this side, well, the natural log of gamma 2 m uh, M2, natural log of A times B is equal to the natural log of A plus the natural log of B. So this is all M2 times D log gamma 2M plus D log M2. <clears throat> so what we can do is separate some things here, uh, do some separation of variables and integrate. So I have the integral of D log M2 here, and then that is equal to the integral of uh, d phi, I believe I've divided both sides by m2. So we have just d phi here. We have uh, phi over m2 there. We get a uh, d log gamma m2 over m2 there, so that goes to that term. And then we have our uh, we have our d log m2 there. So we get a we get a phi minus one there. So we take all these integrals. So when we have when the molality of our solute is equal to zero, 
our activity coefficient is equal to 1 because our solution becomes ideal as the molality of the solute goes to 0. And also our osmotic coefficient is going to equal 1 because our solution becomes more and more ideal as it becomes more dilute. So what we're going to do is the integral from our initial state is going to be a uh, activity, sorry, our initial state is going to be the log of the activity coefficient going from 0 up to 1, the integral from 1 up to phi of the osmotic coefficient, and the plus the integral from 0 to the molality of phi minus 1 over the molality integrated with respect to the molality. So the integral of d log gamma is just log gamma. So our log of our activity coefficient of the solute ends up being the integral from of d phi is going to just be phi minus 1. So we have osmotic coefficient minus 1 plus the integral of phi minus 1 over molality integrated from 0 to the molality. So note here that for ideal solutions the osmotic coefficient equals 1. So this here is going to be a number which is pretty close to is pretty close to 0. Um, this phi minus 1 versus molality is going to be pretty close to 0 for any kind of dilute molality. So uh, any deviation away from this is going to be pretty small. It's going to be pretty close to 0 on this side. And a natural log pretty close to 0 means our activity coefficient is going to be pretty close to 1. But we've got the deviations away from ideal behavior here because now instead of measuring now instead of measuring our vapor pressure of our solute in order to get what its activity is, all we have to do is measure the osmotic coefficient as a function of molality. So we can get our osmotic coefficient from the natural log of the activity of the solvent, and we can get the activity of the solvent from its vapor pressure. So here we've gone in a roundabout way to use the vapor pressure and the activity of the solvent to get at what is our activity of the solute when we have a solute which doesn't produce any appreciable vapor pressure for us to measure.